Well, this morning we're in 1 Corinthians again, chapter 10, and if you'll find your place, we'll start with verse 14. Today I'm preaching on American Idol, Idols and the Lord's Supper, and you'll see where I'm going when you find your place in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 10, 14, let's all stand in reverence to the reading of God's holy, infallible, inspired, inerrant word. Wherefore, you with me? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. I think they've got the wrong scripture up there on the board, but okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Or are we stronger than He? Let us pray. Father, I thank You for the reading of Your Word. What profound uh, reading this is that we need to understand that as we come to this table today, we come with clean hands and a pure heart. So I ask you right now, God, would you touch each of us? And I pray that each of us as individuals would even pray this prayer. Dear Lord, forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. May I come with clean hands and a pure heart that I might worship you. And in worshiping you, as the song just said, that I might have communion. Help us to understand what communion is today. And I pray your Holy Spirit now would anoint this time as we study your word. And may we see this time is the most precious time of all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. Last Sunday, Miss Faye did a great job. Amen. Amen. And you know what? I thought about Miss Faye. When you play a game of sports, football, basketball, and it goes into overtime, everybody ought to get really excited. Amen? Amen. Amen. And uh, Faye felt uh, she, she lost her track of time, but Faye, I saw that as overtime. That was just uh, wonderful that because, you know what, we'd have stayed for a ball game and we'd have stayed excited. Come on now. I know we got some sports people here. We got some Carolina fans here. I mean, anyway, but, uh, and I know we got a bunch of other fans. Once a people view themselves as their highest authority, whatever they most value becomes their God. And that's why I'm dealing with idolatry because I'm telling you folks, there's a lot of things out there that we're not even conscious of. I mean, we don't even ever think about. And I'm going to name some of them today that we need to deal with. While waiting for his train, a man was uh, talking to the uh, conductor, and as they spoke, an express train went by it. I mean the speed of light. I mean, it blew the guy's hat off. The man said to the uh, conductor, what a powerful engine. The, the, the conductor replied, yes, but only while it's on the tracks. Off the tracks is the weakest thing in the world. And when I read that, I thought about the Christian life. The Christian life is like that. Our power lies in our Savior, but when we lead the path of, of the Word of God, or we leave communion or fellowship like a derailed train, we're going nowhere fast. In fact, we're going to all be derailed. And a lot of people are in a wreck today. I mean, their life is a wreck. Why is that? They've derailed. They've got off the track. And so what I want to do today is to help you maybe get on track, because that's what Paul was doing, is he's teaching the Corinthian Christians to get on track, because he's saying you could be derailed. One of those things he says that will derail you is idolatry. They don't have to be derailed by idolatry, but they will if they're not careful. So the I want to give you three words today. The three words are this, command, commission, covenant. 
Those are the three words you need to remember today. Command, commission, covenant. So let's look at the first uh, command. All right, look at verse 14. Here's the command. He says, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. We've, we've dealt with this. In fact, we've dealt with this scripture. We've been in 1 Corinthians 10, and we've dealt in chapter 8. And chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians goes together with chapter 10 because Paul has been dealing with this thing of, of eating meat or eating any kind of food or drink that had been offered to idols. And for the younger Christians, listen carefully because i got to come back to this. The younger Christians, this was becoming offensive. Uh, they were like, wait a minute. How can you eat meat that was offered in idol worship. I mean, how, how could you do that? Because that's what we used to do, and Jesus has changed our life, and we don't want to be reminded of what we used to be. We were blinded to these things. We didn't know that that was, you know, not God. We were worshiping the wrong God. But now we're on track, and, and you older Christians are saying, well, there's nothing to that idol, so why should you even worry? And Paul did address that. He said, you know, what is an idol? It's nothing but a piece of wood or, or, or a piece of stone or whatever. It's, it's not a god. It's just something that man has made up. But the fact was that these younger Christians were offended, and they were weaker Christians. And Paul said, you stronger Christians should think of the weaker Christians and, and so forth. So here's where I want to go with this. Anything that is going to get you off track in your walk with God, you need to stay away from it. In fact, let me just call it for what it is. Anything you have to do in secret is of the devil. It is. Are y'all listening to me? Anything you do that you're ashamed of, anything you do that you have to hide, that ought to be a red flag. Because any time you're doing that, I'll tell you what you're doing. You're coming to the table of devils. Oh, yeah. Somebody needs to call it for what it is. Uh, pornography is coming to the table of the devil. And it would be dangerous to come to this table if you, if you looked at porn last night. I would pass this by. It's a serious thing. You can't live any old way and think that you can come and have communion with God. And so Paul is giving a strong command here. Flee! Get away from this! Don't have nothing to do with it. And, 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 and let me say to you, whoever you are, whatever it is that's tempting you, because that's the context Paul's dealing with, just say no. I've got some little children in my new members class now, and I, I've turned the adults over to Jeremy, and I'm teaching the children, and I'm teaching them. You can say no. You don't have to give in to your peers' pressure, and you don't have to give in to what other kids are saying. If some kid tells you, let's go steal this, or let's go, let's go drink this, or let's go smoke this, you can say no. And adults, we can say no. We need to learn that. The, what I want to put under command is stand. He says, my dearly beloved, he uses the word wherefore, in view of the dangers and temptations that beset you, in view of your own feeble, feebleness and the pearls to which you would be exposed in the idol temples, Paul just spoke and said, stand. Look what he said in verse 12. I didn't read that, but verse 12 says, wherefore let him that think if he standeth, take heed lest he fall. The believer who thinks he can stand may fall, but the believer who flees will be able to stand. Amen? If you flee from it, you can stand. But if you are straddling the fence, and by the way, I'm convinced that most Christians are miserable because they got one foot in the world and one foot in the church, and that's why you got so many sad people on Sunday morning. The reason there's no joy is because we know that we're dabbling in the devil stuff, and it's dangerous. It's time to take a stand. we got to take a stand in our family, amen? Uh, we went to visit a home uh, Monday night, a family, they may be here today, that visited us last week, and I, I loved it. We, we knocked on the door, and over the man's doorpost, for me and my house, we served the Lord. I mean, he had that painted in on the, on the, on the house. It's for, I've seen it inside houses, but he had it over the door. That's taking a stand. We must stand strong in the Lord. We will either stand for something or we'll fall for anything. It's time for God's people to stand. And then Paul said under this command, 
He talked about being sensible. Look at verse 15. I speak as to wise men. Paul's saying be wise about this. Be sensible. Any fool can follow the devil. It takes a wise man to follow Jesus. Wise men still seek him. Amen? And think about it. Any fool can act like a fool. We're all just one step away from being a fool. One decision away. It's so easy to be fooled by the devil. He is above everything a deceiver, and he will deceive you, and he'll deceive me. In context here, Paul explained the reason why. The idol itself is nothing, but it can be used by Satan to lead you into sin. Idolatry is demonic. You need to be careful, church. And I want to be sensitive to everybody here, because I know how easy it is to be deceived. But some of this stuff like yoga, is that how you say it? Eastern religion stuff, you want to stay away from that stuff. Anything that's going to lead you. You, be, you, you read. I, I did some Googling last night. Martial arts. Got a lot of stuff in it that's dangerous. You just need to think. Okay, I'm just asking you. For me, I'm going to stay away from that stuff. Be careful of, uh, of, of what groups you associate yourself with. Make sure you understand what they believe. Because before you know it, you'll be bowing down to some idol. And what, the reason I'm dealing with this issue is because God is most offended right here. He said it in the first and second commandment. You're to have no other gods before me. I mean, he said it very clearly. You are not to worship any other but me. And the day you refuse to do that, you will die. Without me, without Jesus, there is no life. We, we got to think. God gave us a brain. We need to be using it. Be sensible, he's saying. Then he says, there must be separation. Judge ye what I say. So I wanted to get this far before we come to do anything with this table. Because I always try to help you be prepared. So I want to talk about separation for a minute. He says, judge ye what I say. And then he says in verse 20, the latter part, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with the devil, with devils. Paul's saying, make a decision based on what I'm saying. The Lord's Supper is an act of separation. The Lord's Supper reminds us who we are and whose we are. There has been a separation from the world and reconciliation to God, according to Ephesians 2.16. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we examine ourselves. No one can judge another's motive. But each must examine, the Bible says, himself. So I'm asking you right now, would you have some time for self-examination? We must consider our attitudes and our actions. Now listen to verse 21. I wanted to get here. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. When you make the separation from the cup of demons and the, cup and the table of devils, from the cup and table of the Lord, then and only then can you have true communion. There must be separation before there can be true communion. And we're going to get into communion right, right now. But as I do, I'm going to let Jack and Mike go ahead and remove the top of the, the, the covering for the Lord's Supper. And I want us to have a quick prayer as they do this. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that we will flee. We will flee from anything that would separate us from you. And now I ask you to help me in this sermon to explain communion. I've talked about the command to flee. And now I ask you, Lord, to help me that we might truly understand what we're about to do. We call it communion, but do we understand what it really means? In Jesus' name, amen. Now look at verse... You guys can be seated, okay? So here's the thing. Look at verse 16. The cup of blessing, which we bless, and we're about to do that. We're about to bless the elements of the Lord's Supper. He says, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The Greek word for communion, y'all know what it is, don't you? What is it? Koinia. The word koinia means intimate fellowship in the Lord. So I'm going to call you to intimacy right now. You see, the means the Lord's Supper is, it's a vital 
sharing. It's a, it's a vital communication. While the Lord is always uh, with His faithful, there is a very special and intimate way that He is with us during the Lord's Supper. That's why I had them to take that cloth on. I want you to look at what is down here. And some of you may not see it, but there is one, two, three, four, five trays. By the way, did you know the numbers in the Bible are significant? Five is the number of grace. Yeah, five is the number of grace. And we have five trays of juice, which is symbolic of his blood. We have one, two, three, four trays of bread. Now I want to ask you something. Are you serious about this tonight, this morning? Are you, are you serious? Do you understand what intimacy is? Do you know there's not a man, there's not a woman here that don't need intimacy? I'm telling you something. I believe you can be intimate and I'm not talking about just a physical relationship. I'm talking about an emotional relationship. I'm talking about something even more important than an emotional or even a mental relationship. I'm talking about a spiritual relationship. Sherry, come here. Sherry is my intimate person on this earth. We are one. And I wanted to, I want to do something. I, the Lord put this on my heart while we're singing. She was up here jumping all over the place, doing the children's choir, leading the church, and then leading the choir. And here's what the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart. You need to be thankful for her. And so our anniversary is Monday, and here's an intimate moment. I am so proud you're my wife. You are a true partner in ministry. And this is an intimacy. I couldn't do what I do without her. So excuse me. Mm. Mm. Oh, yeah. The Bible says, probably got some lipstick on me now, <laughs> greet, greet each other with a holy kiss. And every time I've kissed her, it's been holy. In fact, the first place I kissed her was, uh, uh, I went, and I know you're going to think this is so stupid, but I went to the altar and I said, Daddy, can I kiss her? And he said, yes. <laughs> so uh, I kissed her at church first time. So what is this intimacy? I wanted you to get a picture of intim intimacy for a minute. That, you know what? I love her and she loves me. But you know what the big thing about our relationship is? We both love Jesus. Amen. And that's what brings us together. That spiritual intimacy. And by the way, guys, can I teach you something real quick? You're not going to ever have any physical intimacy if you don't have the spiritual intimacy. You're not going to, some of those guys are just smiling from ear to ear this morning. But let me tell you something, guys. you got to get this right. It's a spiritual thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a mental thing before it ever is a physical thing. God wants men and women to be intimate in Christ. Well, what's that got to do with the Lord's Supper? Everything. Because you see, the Bible says he's the groom and we're the bride, right? Is that right? And guess what? This time right here, he's saying, I want you to remember how much I love you. <laughs> I want you to remember how I hold you dear. I, you're dear to my heart. I, I love you so much. I sent my son to die for you. And, and you want to know how much he loves you? He stretched out both arms. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he stayed there out of love for you. Well, so what, what's the big thing about this intimacy? Well, the communion, the Bible teaches, is the new covenant. Now, we're going to close in talking about covenant. But before we get there, we got to talk about this communion. Because just as God made a covenant with Israel, and, he, and that, by the way, y'all do know that co covenant still stands, right? He says, I will bless the nation that blesses Israel. I will curse the nation that curses Israel. That's the covenant God entered into with Abraham. But I want to teach you something you may not understand today. There is a better covenant. Oh, yeah, the Bible says it in Hebrews. And the covenant is the new covenant of his blood. That's what I need to share with you when it comes to intimacy. The communion is the new covenant, the precious red ruby royal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that song. Oh, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners who plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed ones of God be saved to sin no more. This juice represents holy blood. This is the blood that washes 
our sins away. Do you desire true intimacy with God? Then allow the red, hot, ruby, royal, righteous, redeeming blood of Jesus Christ to wash you right now and make you whole. God wants an intimate love relationship with His creation, and He did everything in order to have it. Now here's the question. Where are you in this most intimate of relationships? Before you take of this bread, before you take of this juice, you've got to ask yourself the question, where am I in my communion, in my intimacy, in my relationship with God? Now the devil wants this kind of relationship, and he has it for many. Jesus gives us a Valentine heart, so to speak. You remember the little Valentine heart you come in a little box, and, 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 and it was written on there? I, I thought if I had a way, I'd write, can I take one of these pieces of bread? I won't give it to nobody else. This will be mine. But that's what Jesus said. I want you to be mine. <laughs> be mine. I love you. Be mine. You see, we serve a very jealous God. He don't want you taking of any other table than this one. He, he wants your worship. He wants your communion. I like that song that says our worship turns into communion. And by the way, it should be. And there's a, there's a holy hush over this church right now. I can sense it. No one's looking around or talking. The, the, there's an intimacy going on right now in our church. And, and that's going to lead to what I want to say about covenant. But before I do that, let's talk about identification. He says, the bread which we break... Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, do you know what this bread is? Some of you may not understand this. This is called unleavened bread. Do you know why we take unleavened bread? Because bread that has yeast in it represents sin. Okay? So we take unleavened bread. I, I hope to get someone in our church, maybe Donna or someone, who uh, Donna West or someone who's good at cooking, to make some unleavened bread for us sometime. And I'd like a cookie cutter that cuts it up in crosses. Because I'd like to be reminded of that's what he did on the cross. He gave his body for us. Amen? But this, this is good right here. This, this, this is good. Because you see, it reminds us of, of, of our identification. We identify with the body of our precious Savior. For it is by his stripes, the Bible says, we are healed. His body was bruised and it was broken. It was the body that took sin, shame, and sorrow for you and I. And you and I ought to take this time to identify. We, if you can't identify with this piece of bread this morning, because the Bible says, Jesus said it best, I am the bread of life, then I pray that you'll come to Him and identify with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, and then the next point, and then we're going to take a, we're going to get into the supper, because I really want to come down hard about covenant. Because I don't know if we realize how important the covenant is. But before I get there, I want to talk about this word which leads us to covenant. Interdependent. Look at verse 17. Let's, let's go back to our scripture. For we be in many, talking about we as a church, we are one bread, one bread, one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Now it's interesting, in verse 17 you see the word one three times. I believe that reminds us that we're one with the Father, one with the Son, and one with the Holy Spirit. There's only one God and there's none other. There's only one bread and there is none other. We are many members but one body. To interpret in the proper context, there's only one loaf of bread and it's not cut up in slices. Okay? There's only one Lord here. Every member of the body has a gift to bring to the body. But there's only one head telling us how to use our gifts. I want you to be thinking. I'm going to say this twice. I'm getting ahead of myself purposely. He said, in remembrance of me. My last sub point I'm going to make today, he wants us to do this in remembrance of him. Because he don't want us to forget where we come from. And listen, this is where I really want to hit a home run with our church today. And we need to remember that we are His church, and this is not our church. This is His church, because you didn't pay the price for this church. He paid the price for it. And you say, are you talking about the members of the building? Both. <laughs> this is His work. This is His building. But you are His body. And you need never forget where you've come from because you were a dirty, filthy, no good for nothing, lousy sinner, and Jesus reached way down to pick you up. How about... Amen. He did for me. 
And, and I, I want to tell you what that means now. We are to be interdependent. In other words, there's a communion that needs to happen right now. And I sort of gave you a picture of Sherry. Now, I'm not asking all of y'all to kiss each other. But I am saying this. We're to love each other because he first loved us. There is an interdependence. I, I had the word first interwoven, but I changed it to interdependent because God wants us to depend on each other. You see, that's where the scripture says, when one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoice, we all rejoice. By the way, I'm proud of you. For the last few weeks, I've seen our church step up. And, and this is harder for the younger generation. The older generations seem to get it, but the younger ain't quite got it. And that is how to minister to a family when they're hurting. The food thing is a big deal. And the older people do a pretty good job with it. Us younger folks, notice I said us, us younger folks need to learn to do what the older folks do. Participate in that. You know why? We're ministering to a hurting person. And anytime you're ministering to a hurting person, listen to me, I'm going somewhere. It draws us closer to God as well as to one another. Jesus, you're talking about in pain on that cross. He was suffering and dying. And we need to understand, had it not been for what he did for us, we wouldn't be together today. We're here today because of Jesus, amen? And he wants us to learn to operate, to look like his body, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We glorify one God and we edify one body, the body of the Lord Jesus. Notice the word one. I don't believe you're to have any other gods or any other thing before you. Uh, my loyalty is to him. I don't, I don't do anything else. I don't. I, I'm like, you're going to be my everything. You're Lord of all. You ever thought about how the geese fly together? As each bird flaps his wing, it creates an uplift for the bird immediately following. Now listen to this. By flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds, this is a fact, at least 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew on his own. Whenever a goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and resistance of trying to go it along and quickly gets back into the formation to take advantage of the, uh, of the uplift, of the lifting power of the bird immediately in front. If we have as much sense as a goose, we will stay in formation with those who are headed the same direction we are. If we're all going to heaven, we ought to be going together, amen? Uh, God's never called any of us to go along. When the, lead go, when the lead goose gets tired, he rotates back in the wing, in the wing and another uh, goose flies point. The geese in the back honks. You hear those geese all the time out of honking. Well, there's a reason. From behind, he is to encourage those in front to keep up the speed. And here's my question to you. What do we say? when we honk from behind. Many times I'm sorry the church don't say the right things. And if you can't say something to build someone up, look up here. I, I learned this from a church member years ago. I was in this church and it was great. I mean, I, I, told, I, I told this lady, I said, man, I've been here 10 years. I've not heard one negative thing. She said, preacher, it's because of me. I said, what do you mean because of you? She said, well, I'm 88 years old. I'm considered the mom in this church. And I just tell people all the time, you need to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> and that's what she would tell people. I thought I was in the perfect church. I never heard anything bad. This is the truth. Her name was Hazel Hill. And Hazel, I did her funeral. She's gone on to glory. But you know what? She did the best thing that could happen in that church. She was respected is the elder, and she told all the young people, you need to keep your mouth shut. And church, we need to learn from that. Amen. Because you know what? There's only one who has a voice in this thing. The bottom line is, is what God says. It's not what you say, it's not what I say, it's what God says. And look, we all need Him, amen? amen. All right, we're going to come to this table, and I'm going to start talking about the covenant in just a minute. But I'm going to ask our deacons to come, and, and as we bless the bread, I want, I want to read this scripture again. Come on, guys. It says, the cup of blessing which we bless. You know what that means? It means to give thanks. 
okay? I want you to be thankful right now. And I'm going to continue to preach as they pass out the bread. But the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? There's an intimacy, an identification. I want to leave those words up there in front of us. In, interdependent. We need each other. We need each other. Mike, would you bless the bread? Thank you, Heavenly Father. We approach this thank you today, dear Lord. Remember what you did for us here in the blood of Jesus Christ on that cross, dear Lord. Just put the words in the pastor's mouth that we need to hear, dear Lord. Let it permeate down to our hearts, dear Lord. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord, just bless and guide and direct us and let us always remember what you did for us, dear Jesus yeah. Christ, on that cross. The greatest gift God could ever give us was his son who died on the cross for his sins. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, as they take the bread and distribute it, I want you to be thinking about what I just got through preaching. Because as you take that bread, you are in communion with the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you right now to claim the intimacy I just talked about. The love that God has for you. To think about that He loved you so much that He gave His body. That's what you just put in your hand. As you take that bread, I want you to say in your heart and, and give God the holy reverence right now He deserves. Lord, I love you. Thank you. Thank you for giving yourself. I give myself to you. I do not come to no table of idols. I don't come worshiping some demon. That's what he's talking And demonic things are real. They're all around us. And Paul was saying, we're not, we're not idol worshipers. We worship the true living God. Put this behind you. That's the command. Flee from idolatry and cleave to intimacy, identification, and interdependence. Be interdependent. We all need each other. I want you to think about your love for God right now. And then I want you to identify with the fact that you are a member of the body of Christ. Would you identify? What body is that? Well, this body called Gord Springs. God didn't make a mistake. He put this body together to glorify Him. And so I want you to understand something. I'm not just up here flapping my lips while they're passing out the bread. I want you to get this. God put us together for a reason. Are y'all listening? And he wants you to love each other. And if you can't love each other, then you best not put that bread in your mouth. Now, no one's going to take the bread until we're supposed to. But don't put that bread in your mouth if you don't love your brother and sister in Christ. Don't do it. Because Jesus, he hung on that cross for one reason. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know what held him on that cross? Are y'all looking up here? His love for you. Now I'm going to ask you, would you love him back? And would you understand you're identified with the body of Christ? You are his church. And I want you to think about this as they bring the bread back. Think about this. We need each other. You may not think you do. You may think, well, I can be independent. I don't, I don't need you. Let me tell you something about these deacons right here. I couldn't do this ministry without these men. Did y'all know that? I can't do that. Why do you have deacons? So they can help the pastor. What are the deacons doing this morning? They're helping me. Okay, guys, now I'm going to help them. Okay? It all works together. And by the way, when you see a pastor and deacons working together, it's because they love Jesus. Okay? I loved Jesus before I ever met Mike Mason or Jack Smith or Randy Hazen or Ray Mason. But one thing I love about these deacons, when they take this bread, you know what they say? I love you, Pastor. And you know, that has meant the most to me since I've, I've never been in a church where I serve deacons, and I didn't lead this church to do this. I don't know how this started, but I've never been in a church where a deacon says, I love you, brother. Thank you. I love you, brother. Thank you. That's what he said. That means a lot to me. And I think the thing that solves a lot of the issues in any church is whether or not they truly love each other. Amen. Really. That's what I look for in a church. I do. And by the way, you need to hear this from my lips. I want to be in a church where I'm loved. And I want to be in a church that I can love others. Amen. Are y'all listening? Without love, what does the Bible say? Love you, I love you, Jack. Appreciate you.
You're nothing. That's right. Love you, brother. Lord, I pray for my brother, Mike. I love him. I thank you for his leadership and our deacons. I ask you to bless him as he's facing this surgery, that just as he takes this bread, that the same stripes that you bore on that cross, you said by your stripes were healed. And so I claim that when Mike takes his bread in his body and he consumes it, that by your stripes he be healed. Yes. In Jesus' name I give you glory. Yes, Hallelujah. Amen. 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 So preachers, you know you're going to do that? Nope. <laughs> no, I didn't know I was going to do that. I'm trying to be intimate. You want to be intimate with God? Be obedient to God. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Amen. I love you, church. Let's take that on that. All right. Now the covenant. Because the blood is the covenant. We're going to come to the blood in just a minute. But this is the most important thing I've got to say to you. And I've never preached like this, but I know God gave it to me and I'm going to give it to you. This covenant is very serious. When God makes a covenant, let me tell you something about God's covenant. He always keeps His word. It's more than a promise. Number one, it's in relationship. Look at verse 17. For we be in many, or one bread, one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. The church is the body of Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. I want to make sure we establish that. We're the body of Christ. We are in a covenant relationship with God and with one another. Can I say that again? This is, we're still coming to the table. But I want you to understand, when you take this juice, it is representative, it's symbolic of the new covenant, which is His blood. We are in a covenant relationship with God. I want to say it again, and with one another. The church has been brought bought with the precious blood of Christ, which is the New Testament, or, or the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, Jesus does more than just save us from sin. He saves us for something. And that something is to serve Him as the body of Christ, as He's called us. He didn't call me to serve Him alone. He didn't call you to serve Him alone. We're in relationship. By doing so, our relationship deepens with Him. Are y'all hearing me clearly? Every person has a responsibility. And with every responsibility in this relationship, there is accountability. Listen to what He says in Hebrews 8, 6. But now hath He obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also He is the mediator of a better covenant. That's where I'm coming from. That's the context I'm talking about. A better covenant which was established upon better promises. That's Hebrews 8, 6. The new covenant by the blood of Jesus comes with greater promise and greater responsibility. When you join this church, for example, you entered into a covenant with God and with other members of this body. That is why when one hurts, we all hurt. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. We're under a greater responsibility and an accountability to one another. We're not to be Inner, we're not to be independent of one another. We're to be interdependent, as we just said. We need each other to function as the body of Christ. So when you are not fulfilling your responsibility in the body called the church, the whole church becomes crippled. We cannot function as the body of Christ. Can a hand function without an arm? Can it? Well, I asked one of my deacons to give me a hand. This is what I got. Now, I'll ask something. I'm not trying to be funny or nothing, but can this hand do anything? No, it can't do nothing. It, that hand, if that hand moves, like on the monster movies, y'all remember the monster movies, you know, the hand that stuck up from the box and all. It's just a piece of wood. I guess you could say that's sort of like a, some kind of idol or something. It's just a piece of wood. It, it's nothing. It won't, it won't, I don't think it won't, it, it won't pick that up. No, not going to pick that up. I don't think it can play the piano. Let's see. I doubt that thing's strong enough to even hit a key with me holding it. Nah, ain't got no strength in it. There's no strength. There, look how flimsy that thing is. It's a bad hand. 
It won't work. It's no good. And what good, that's all, I better be careful this thing. You better be good. <laughs> this hand is of the devil. <laughs> Get rid of that hand. It's no good. And by the way, I'm no good without you, and you're no good without me, and none of us are any good without him. Amen. Friend, all you are without Jesus is that dumb hand over there. You can't do, that thing's still doing bad stuff. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're in a relationship. I thought that might get your attention. We can't function alone. Can a hand function without an arm? No, all it can do is act stupid. I mean, really. Can a hand function without an arm? We are, we are united as grains of wheat in one loaf of bread. You ever thought about that? That's heavy duty. I said we are united as grains of wheat in a loaf of bread. How, how united is that? Oh, man, that's, that's, that, that's a relationship if I've ever seen. What's the relationship between the church growing together on the inside and affecting the community on the outside. I'll tell you how God spoke to my heart about this building. And I know long before this, this was over four years ago, God spoke to my heart about that building. This is how God spoke to me. The church wanted the building. Here's what God put on my heart. You grow the church from within, I'll take care of it from without. Because you see, you're the church. You're the body of Christ. And here's what I want to say. What's the relationship between the church growing together on the inside so we can affect the community on the outside. Amen. Oh, what God can do. But if we're not together, if one of you, if one of you wants to go over here and pick up this stupid hand that Randy brought, <laughs> it's still messed up. Anyway, that's just a broke, that's, that's not attached to anything. It's not attached to an arm. It can't do anything. It, it, it is a non-functioning member. It, it, it will not work. But I'll tell you this. If you and I are interdependent in this relationship and we're all walking together because we all are attached to the right head, the Lord Jesus Christ, I promise you this, we're all going to be working together. I promise you that. Because there's only one head to the body. Am I right? We're fixing to take of this juice. But I want you to understand something. It, it is holy blood because this covenant is not only in relationship, it's in righteousness. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord, he said, and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. The Lord's Supper is a call to repentance. We have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Anything you have to hide is of the table of devils and demons. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Paul instructed you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Sincerity is called for here. Hypocrisy is dispelled here. Isaiah 46, uh, 42, 6 says, I the Lord have called you in righteousness and, you will hold, and I will hold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people for a light to the Gentiles. That's us. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. I only have one more thing to say, but I want us to come and get ready to take this precious red ruby royal redeeming blood of Jesus. Because church, listen to me. The devil don't want nobody to claim this, but you are made righteous because of this divine covenant. You are. You are the righteousness of God. You say, preacher, I don't have any righteousness. No, then you don't have Jesus. But if you've got Jesus, you stand on his righteousness. So our deacons are going to come, and we're going to bless this cup in the name of Jesus, because he is our righteousness. Amen? Amen. He is our righteousness. Jack, will you lead us? Father, we thank you that over 2,000 years ago, you shed your precious blood upon that cross for the yes. remission of our sins. We thank you for your forgiveness today. Father, we love you, and we just want to honor and praise you for all that you've done for us. I thank you again for this day and that we're able to partake because of what you've done for us. In your name we pray. 
Amen. Amen. So as you take this cup, be blessed today because this is the cup of blessing. What a blessing it is that we can be here today. And the last point I want to make, this is a powerful, powerful point. In fact, it is written right here on this table. In remembrance. I want to close before we leave here today talking about something I believe is powerful. More powerful than anything I've ever thought of, I believe. He says in verse 22, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? Now what Paul's referring to here, he's saying that you stronger Christians, you think you can do any old way because you're more mature? He's talking to the older people in the congregation. He's talking to the more mature, the stronger Christian. Just because you know that idols are nothing and, and that this meat that has been sacrificed to idols is nothing, it's just meat, then you need to remember something. There, there's a lot of people looking at you. Are y'all listening to me? People are watching us all. Somebody needs to set up in their pew and take notice because somebody's looking at you right now. And you know, I, I want you to remember where you are. You're in the house of God. We need to be reminded of that. There's, this needs to be a place that we respect. It needs to be a place that we come to meet God. We need to remember that coming to this table should never be out of habit. And God somehow, over many years, has put it in my heart to never come to this table the same way. Never. And I've never done that as your pastor. God's always given me something. He's already given me something for next Easter. Are y'all with me? Oh, I'm going somewhere. Don't you worry. Do not provoke the Lord to jealousy. We best remember where we came from. We were lost, dirty, ungodly people. But God in His new covenant, the precious blood of Jesus has cleansed us and we must never forget the price He paid with that little cup that you're about to take. What a rich, 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 rich blessing. It costs God everything. Say it with me, if you would. For God so loved the world, say it with me, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, what a blessing. What a cup of blessing that by taking this juice, it is symbolic of the blood that Jesus shed for us. And in shedding that blood for us, we become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody ought to have a spell. Amen. Amen. Amen brother. Okay, guys. I'm telling you, I love talking about the blood. There's power in the blood. Amen. Wonder working power. And let me tell you something about this power. It's never been lost. I'm telling you, the blood of Jesus, and we're fixing to give an invitation, will wash all your sins away. Because, listen to me, His grace is greater than all your sins. Amen. Now, you say, Preacher Ronnie, I'd like to believe that. Well, you can believe it and receive it, or you can doubt and do without it. Because I'm going to claim the blood in my life. How about you? When you see Preacher Ronnie sitting out here on the pew, and he's praising God, and he's lifting up his hands. I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it because he's righteous, not me. In fact, for me, not to enter into his presence would be as dangerous as that uh, priest who was in the Holy of Holies. I, I want to enter. You know, it was dangerous if he didn't do the right thing in the Holy of Holies. Folks, it's dangerous if we don't praise him. Amen. It's dangerous if we don't thank him. That's what this... Covenant is all about. Man, I'm going to tell you, I'm thankful for this opportunity I've had today to come to this table. Love you, Mike. Thank you. Thank God for this blood, the red, ruby, royal blood of Jesus. But before we take this, this is what God put on my heart to say to you as a church. It is like Jesus is saying now, be the one church I died for. 
in remembrance of me. I take notes on God, by the way. He spoke to my heart about this. He said, tell Gord Springs, it is like Jesus is saying, now be the one church I died for in remembrance of me. Do the ministry at Gord Springs I called you to do in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me, God spoke to my heart. Listen very carefully, because God told me to tell you this. You're to love one another. And in remembrance of me, forgive one another. I'm just telling you what he put on my heart. I took notes on him last night. And here's what he said. In remembrance of me, be my people. Be my body. Be my church. Is your face up there anywhere? Do you see it? Anybody see your face up there? Look very closely, and you will. Everybody's face is in that body, if you know Jesus. You say, preacher, I don't literally see my picture up there, but I want you to start seeing it right now. Picture yourself as being a member of the body of Christ. And it's all because of his blood that he was able to do that. You say, preacher, that don't look like the church. That is the church. Amen. That is the church. That's the church he purchased with his own blood and his own body. And he did it all. For who? For you. And he said, do it in remembrance of me. This is my body, which is given for you. I don't know. I have never thought about this. But God really spoke to my heart and said, don't you ever give up, Ronnie. You do what you do in remembrance of me. You keep preaching the gospel in remembrance of me. You keep serving the Lord in remembrance of me. You stay faithful to your church, church members, because we're in a covenant. And when you are not here, the body can't function. No, we all need each other. We need each other. And we need each other. We do what we do. Do y'all get it? In remembrance of me. Let's bow our head. We're fixing the same. Weak and wounded sinner. Lost, left to die. Oh, raise your head, for love is passing by. Come to Jesus and live. Now your burden's lifted and carried far away. And precious blood has washed away the stain. So sing to Jesus. Sing to Jesus. Would you sing to Jesus by remembering what he's done for you on the cross? Remember the day is not too late to come to Jesus, but tomorrow will be. And so I invite you now, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, this is the question. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that the same presence of God that I felt in administering this table today would be spread throughout this congregation in the hearts of even those who may not know you, and your Holy Spirit would draw them today. May your love be so strong here today as we have witnessed what this communion is all about, the bread and the blood, the new covenant in Jesus Christ. We're in covenant with you, O God. We're in covenant with one another. We must be the church that remembers in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing as Jack and Mike put the cloth back over it. Would you come today? This is the invitation for you to come. I love this song, one of my favorite. Come to Jesus. Would you come right now?